Welcome, everyone. My name is Richard Buckner. I am one of the evangelists in the GPCC, Greater Philadelphia Church of Christ. And what I'm doing is recording a lesson that I gave a couple of weeks ago to uh, one of our groups um, for a midweek, a Wednesday night. We did it over Google Meet. And at the time, Google Meet we were not able to record the class live. Uh, there was uh, something on the back end that uh, at that time just prevented us from recording the class. So I decided to record the class uh, for those um, who missed it. I got enough emails of people inquiring, hey, can you, can you, can I get access to that class? And me letting them know, hey, we didn't have that class. And I thought, hey, well, I got the notes, everything I can record in my own home and then, and then post it up on YouTube. And voila, we are here. So welcome, uh, wherever you're at. If you are listening to us in your home, or I guess it would be in your home in this state of affairs. Uh, maybe you could be listening as you're driving or walking or, or whatnot. Hopefully you are social distancing yourself. But um, I'm glad that you are here and with us, and I hope that this class is very helpful for you. So uh, again, I want to extend a hello and welcome to all of you. Again, the circumstances are still a bit weird. Three weeks ago when I gave this class, circumstances were weird and, and they still are weird. Um, that being said, God can still be glorified. I do hope that this class is a very helpful class um, for many of you and that it leads you to wanting and growing to getting more out of your Bible. So here's what to expect. We're going to have four lessons on this topic, four classes, really. And this is the first of four. Uh, there'll be some homework given each class, Not nothing too overbearing. Again, just stuff to get, get you engaged, keep you engaged. You know, if I give you nothing, then, you know, it's hard for things to stick if, if there's no challenge in it. And so I want to give you a little bit of that to challenge yourself and to dig uh, deeper. I will provide a lot of resources for all of you uh, to continue on your journey. And uh, those who are re-listening to this, you have those resources. Those you're listening for the first time, I'll have all those resources attached in the description for you to have access to all of it. I think the biggest question for you to ask yourself is, hey, what are you looking to get out of this class? Anything that I approach, a uh, new venture, uh, studying something, um, whether I'm watching something, I'm planning a trip, whatever I'm doing, I got to sit down and ask myself, what am I looking to get out of it? Because if I do, then I'm very specific on asking the right questions. I'm very specific on how to study and the process of studying and getting that information or, or going on that venture or trip or whatever. And, and it makes it so much better. So I do want to start on the onset to ask you, what are you looking to get out of the class? And, and for many of you who are starting out with the Bible, it's to know more. Hey, I, I, w I want the tools to be able to to get the most out of my Bible, right? Uh, hence in all the name of this class. But, but some of you, maybe you read your Bible regularly and you have some of those tools. Maybe you need to learn, hey, how, how can I use them better? Um, I want to en enhance my Bible reading. I know the basics. I can get around um, for most of it. Uh, I have certain authors that I like. Um, I have books that I go to for reference, but I want to know more. And some of you, you're coming in here, you, you've, you've gone to further schooling, maybe seminary, maybe you study, maybe you got your MDiv, what, what, what have you, maybe you lead churches, um, there's a lot. This class is not really geared for you, and, and you probably already know that. Uh, maybe spark curiosity, maybe you just want to know what's being taught and what's out there. I'm glad that you're, you're here and you're sitting in on it. But you know, and I know that this class isn't necessarily for you, though I will, I hope to pique your interest in certain things that I'm reading currently, uh, things that I, that I want to glean from you, you know, the next slide I'll, I'll give my email to be in dialogue and some, and some good, uh, healthy debate and, and asking a lot of questions. I'm always on, on the, the prowl, if you will, for, for, for great material. Um, I, I, I love to be challenged in my faith and, and because it drives me to dig deeper in my Bible. And so for you guys at that kind of top tier advance, you're here. I'm glad you're here. I hopefully give you references to books you haven't read and then vice versa. You can do the same for me. Okay. So like I mentioned, uh, here's my email. Please email me 
Uh, I want to be in dialogue with you if it's just to say, hey, I have a question or hey, thank you for the class. That always encourages me. Go through all the emails and I try to respond to people uh, as much as possible. Unless unless it's, I'm sending something out in batch, like people ask me for notes at the end of the class and I'm just going to email them out in batch. But if you send a personal email, I will respond to you and try my best to respond to you. And I very encourage all the time when people uh, show their gratitude and take the time because I know how hard it is, especially during this time and given the circumstances right now, for you to, to take a moment to listen and to find this YouTube channel and this particular video for whatever reason, or maybe you forward it to someone and you're listening to it because your friend told you about it. I'm really grateful. And thank you, thank you, thank you for listening. So let's hop on in. Now, you're looking at a background here right now of camera equipment. And for me, uh, this is my new venture. I'm talking about ventures and doing things. Uh, And the question I ask myself is, can I afford this? (laughs) You know, uh, that's the, that's the starting question that I want to ask myself the real questions. No, this is camera equipment. And for those, for those of you who are photographers, you see all this different stuff and you can probably label it and know what it's used for and know how much it costs. But for those you you don't, you know that this is equipment and and if I get if I have these things, it's going to the assumption is going to help me take better pictures. In theory, yes. But on a basic fundamental level, and this will make sense in terms of Bible reading, getting the most out of your Bible, to take a great picture is going to start with you knowing how to take a great picture picture. It's not going to start with you getting all these tools, all these fancy tools and learn how to do all these fancy tools. It is you learning the fundamentals of taking a great photo without the tools, without the flashiness. It's just you understanding what composition is of taking a great photo. And it's the same way for the Bible. No matter what you surround yourself with, there's a ton of tools out there, same as these in a biblical standpoint in terms of lenses and battery packs and quarters and tripods and all the different things that we can see here. At the end of the day, can you read your Bible effectively? Because you have the commentaries, the dictionaries, you have the Greek and Hebrew lexicons, historical maps, historical timelines, and that character studies, lecture series, whatever, books upon books upon books upon books, lectures upon lectures, anything you get. If you don't know how to read your Bible, these tools will confuse you, uh, will only make your findings be in error if you don't know how to use them. It's not going to help you take a great picture of what God is saying. You need to learn how to do that without all those things, is just simply reading your Bible and getting the most out of it. We'll talk about, and I'll share kind of what the further classes of how to use those tools, because these tools are incredible. I love the tools I have. But but again, it's going to start with me learning how to read my Bible. And so I'm excited about that. And this next verse really encapsulates exactly what I feel and believe about the Bible and the scriptures in Ephesians 3, 16 through 18 is becoming one of my favorite verses uh, these days. It says, I pray that from his glorious and limited resource, he will, he will empower you with inner strength through his spirit. And then Christ will make his home in your hearts as you trust in him. Your roots will grow down in God's love and keep you strong. And may you have the power to understand all as God's people should, how wide, how long, how high, and how deep his love is. Wow. How amazing is that? You're looking at the next slide of just kind of highlighted key words that, that really jump out me. Unlimited resources, right? It, 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 Paul starts off with really just describing God's love and, and, and knowing him and, and what his love brings. The reason why I love this verse is because it, it really explains how I feel about the Bible. The Bible is, is, is highly concentrated goodness of unlimited resources to empower you with inner strength in your spirit, to keep you strong, and for you to understand its power. 
of how wide and how long and how high and how deep the scriptures are. And it's not too far from this verse. I mean, we know that that his word, God is love, and really the, the Bible is a love letter. And describing through detail, whether it's Old Testament through stories and narrative, and we'll talk about that in a little bit, um, or specific teaching as you get into the New Testament, it, it is describing how wide, how long, how high, how deep God's love is. And to me, that is the Bible. And, and I love this verse, and I hope it inspires you as we dig deeper and getting the most out of our Bible. There's a lot to get out of it, right? And we're not straining, <laughs> you know, it's not like we've all read the Bible. It's only like five pages and we're straining for truth. No, it, it, we, we are mining. We are, we are in this cavernous, like, cave looking out and it's so much to be mined. I don't know if you've ever seen those Nat Geo or Natural Geographic type shows where they go cave diving into these incredible wonders of the world. And it's just so vast and empty and so much to explore. That is the Bible. There's so much to mine and understanding how to mine for it and where to look for it is all in, in the key of finding the right um, or finding those those awesome jewels that that are that are there. So I'm excited. I'm excited to jump into this class. This is class one. Thank you for joining us. Again, if, if you're listening to us the second time, thank you for doing that. Um, and so in this class, here's what to expect. The first class, which is tonight, we're going to talk about storytelling. And this is important to me in all of my journeys before I picked up any commentary or got any kind of outside um, you know, tool uh, to help me in my Bible reading. It was just me simply sitting down and understanding the Bible, understanding the mode uh, or genre it was written in. And, and, and when you do that, it just really helps you take in more. It helps you to be more inquisitive and, and, and it teaches you really the, the, the first thing is to understand the scriptures the way the scriptures were, were intended to be read. And so we're going to talk about that tonight in terms of storytelling. In the next class, we'll, once we understand storytelling and we kind of get, okay, this is how the Bible's laid out. This is how to perceive and understand it. Now we can go treasure hunting because in, like I said, in this cave of wonders, right? I'm a big uh, Disney fan of Aladdin, the cave of wonders. But in this cave, there are incredible jewel encrusted wisdom that we can mine. Um, and it leads us onto this amazing treasure hunt to find them, right? Uh, they're, though they're there, buried in plain sight, we still have to find them and uncover them. And who doesn't like a treasure hunting movie? Uh, I'm a big treasure hunt movie guy. And, and when we get to that class, you'll see why. Uh, the next uh, following classes, we'll talk about the essentials. Then we'll start talking about the tools. Hey, here's what to buy. Here's what not to buy. Here's what's cheap. You know, um, it, it, that's all I'm looking for, man. What are some cheap resources that I don't have to drop a lot of money, but get the most uh, for what I'm investing in? We'll talk about those things and I'll help you be able to connect with those things as well. Okay, so let's start off with storytelling. Um, so, when you're talking about storytelling, what does this mean? You know, one of the most important areas for me, depending uh, um, for my Bible study, was learning how to read the Bible in terms of the various types of genre found in its pages. And and if you didn't know, maybe you were aware, maybe you're not. But the, the Bible is written in different types of genre, and it's broken down. And again, we won't go through all the genre. We're just going to stick with storytelling, be, mainly because most of the Bible is in storytelling or narrative form uh, from Genesis to Revelation. And again, when you're talking about genres of literature, it's historical. Uh, you have more of a narrative uh, form. Uh, you have more kind of, um, uh, uh, I want to say medical, but uh, I don't have my, my list in front of me, but but more of, of a documentary type of, of, of instructional uh, form, right? When you, when you look at uh, Leviticus, uh, it's not narrative and it's not history so much, but, but it is written in a, a very kind of uh, medical type uh, form where, where it's like, this, don't do this, do this, don't do this, do this, you know, and, and, and it's, you know, which could be dry. Uh, it's not the best type of uh, type of genre of literature we like, but, but it's there. It's in the scriptures. But like I mentioned, most of the Bible 
is in narrative form. You know, we go from Genesis uh, through the history books, uh, not including some of the um, uh, Psalms and, and Proverbs uh, is not so much included in there, um, but we, we you know, we'll, we'll kind of cover all of that. Um, but some of the major prophets, not all of them, uh, and also in the New Testament, you get into all of the Gospels, Acts, all narrative form, not so much of the epistles and letters. Uh, some you can glean that, but but not so much. Uh, Revelations uh, is kind of told in a, in, a, in a narrative form. And so that's what we're going to camp out on is talking about storytelling. That's the genre of literature we're going to we're going to camp in on. And I think if you master that, you're going to get most of of what you're going to get the most out of your Bible, right? You you're going to be able to learn and discern kind of what the author was doing and what he's trying to do to really get you to see certain points and it get you, you, you just gleam so much more again digging for those those truths. You know, we understand genres like I mentioned before, we look at movies um, genres is not too um, unfamiliar to us when we think of movies. And, you know, when you look at these posters, I try to pick the most popular movies. I mean, they, they hang on being more dated, which tells you how old I am. But I do some of my favorite movies. But immediately we could tell, even if you've never seen these movies, you know, maybe you, you're, you're young and you're like, I don't even know what these movies are. You can tell by the posters uh, what they convey, right? E.T., uh, y- you're talking sci-fi, sci-fi fantasy, right? That that's the genre you're getting into. And and when you walk in there, that's kind of what you're expecting. How do we know? There's a picture of space. There's this weird looking creature uh, that we don't have on Earth. <laughs> the name says extraterrestrial, right? <laughs> the, the bike is flying near a moon. Um, I don't get comedy. Uh, I I guess you can kind of say, well, that, that looks funny, but but I don't get a sense of comedy. Uh, no one's like laughing and bowling over, right? I definitely don't get a sense of romance. It's a strange romance, but I don't get a sense of romance. I get more of sci-fi. You know, next uh, poster, you, you're looking at Shawshank Redemption. And when you're looking at that poster, you you don't get a sense of, of sci-fi. I guess you can kind of say, okay, I see lightning, but I don't know what that means. Is this guy getting power or whatnot? No, I mean, it, when you watch the movie, this is a heavy drama, okay? Uh, a very heavy drama. And, and, it, and it conveys in that way. That, that Look at the colors versus looking at E.T. There's a burst of red, right? It could be danger because red usually symbolizes danger. But there's this burst, like there's just wonder. The, the, they don't look scared on their faces, so you don't get so much of a horror film, you know, because there are, there are space movies that, that like aliens. You can get more of a horror vibe, but you don't get that. Uh, the, the creature, E.T., is more inviting, you know, the boy, he's looking uh, up at, and, 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 and more of a, a, a wonderment, like, what, what is this? When you look at Shawshank Redemption, you get more of the darker tones, uh, the, the blues, uh, you know, literally, <laughs> the color blue and the blues. You know, you see a cop in the picture. You see shadow figures, uh, uh, figures where, where, where part of their face is illuminated, the other part isn't. I mean, and you can not even watch in a movie. You get to see, okay... I know what I'm getting to. This genre is going to be a little darker. Maybe there's crime. I see a cop. Maybe, I don't know. But when you watch a movie, very heavy drama. Now, Princess Bride is a little uh, confusing. You kind of think, do I know what I'm getting myself into? I don't really know. Um, uh, but but at least you think, okay, this has got to be a romance. Um, now, obviously, you watch the movie. It's a comedy. Uh, a very heavy comedy. A, lo- a love, love, love this film. If you have not seen any of these films, please go watch these films and treat yourself. But you can see in the title, The Princess Bride. So there's got to be some type of romance. There's some type of relationship there. You see two silhouetted figures. Again, you don't, I don't get a sci-fi vibe. I can get a fantasy vibe. You know, see the clouds and in the distance, you see what seems like a castle uh, and in columns, you know, it's kind of an older time. Um, but, but I get more of the heavy influence of romance when I see this. And, and, I, and so when I'm going to this movie, I'm not expecting heavy drama. I'm not expecting a sci-fi uh, a movie or sci-fi thriller. Uh, I'm expecting a romance. Now, again, when you watch this, if you only see this poster, you're going to be treated to, oh man, this is incredibly funny. Now, that may throw you off if you really wanted a serious uh, romance movie, but, you know, we understand genre. It comes to us very intuitively. And, and you know, for those who watch a lot of movies uh, or even read novels, you, you know what you're getting by the title or by the author or by the section in the bookstore. You know what you're getting. 
you know, when we approach the Bible, many times we approach it like a textbook. Now, that's great for certain books of the Bible that read that way, but that's not great if majority of the Bible doesn't read that way. You're missing a lot of what the author is trying to do because you're not in the right mi mindset for that genre of literature. Again, for example, if I walked in a Shawshank Redemption expecting a comedy, I'm going to be severely disappointed. And in fact, enraged. And I'm going to miss out on a really great drama movie. And man, and, that, and that's sad that, that I walk out. Man, I thought it was going to be comedy. This movie was garbage. And really, that, that's, that was far from what the director and writer intended it to be. And so again, enough said about that. You understand. Now, let me take this example even further. Not so much what I've already said, but, but to really dive into uh, this idea of when you understand dramas, you really get to some good, good, good stuff. So you see this movie poster of Knives Out. Now, again, again I'm, I'm, I got my degree in graphic design. I love breaking down images and placement and composition. It's just a beautiful thing. And this is a beautiful movie. Um, automatically stands out. You hear it. You see Knives Out. Okay, danger, right? The V has a sharp edge. Even that, even the magnifying glass has a sharp edge to end of it. Murder is involved, right? Uh, you see the magnifying glass. There's, there's kind of a, a detective story, a whodunit. If you've seen this movie, one of my favorite movies of 2019, uh, released uh, in November time around Thanksgiving. Incredible movie, and it's a whodunit, a murder mystery. And, and again, you can even see the composition of how the, the actors are placed. All of them are behind what is the central character. We can assume that's the character who is murdered. Spoiler alert. If you watch the trailers, you don't, don't get mad at me. It's in the trailers. But you can see that. You can see how they're placed. Who is it? We don't know who it is. We've got to look for it. The reason why I'm showing this example to really embellish and drive home the point genre matters is that I, this is the, this is the type of genre I love the most. I love murder mystery genres. I love being able to walk in and really break down and decipher a, a good murder mystery. And Knives Out is a great one. Please go see that. Again, PG-13, you know, uh, there, there's some language in there, you know, be, you know, go online. You can go to Kids in Mind. Kids in Mind's a great resource. Or um, uh, there was another media one. If you email me, I'll give you another one. But some great ones to help tell you exactly what's in the film. Make sure that, that uh, you know, as, as, as Christians, that we're protecting ourselves. But I love, I love going to a murder mystery because in a murder mystery, the, the director and and really the writer uh, and the director too, because the director is giving you, uh, pointing you what to look at and, and what to see. But the director and writer are, are getting you to focus in on two questions, really, or, or two aspects, really. One is carefully paying attention to what is seen because the clues are, are, are in plain sight. And in getting you to ask the right questions, right? That, that's what a good murder mystery really gets you engaged for. I want to really carefully look at every scene and just in and, and every corner of the scene. Like, like no, there's no real estate on that screen that, that's gone empty, right? Everything is, is up for grabs uh, uh, for something to, to give me something. So I got to pay attention. And then secondly, I got to ask the right question. Who is that? Why are they leaving? Why do they leave at this time and not that time? Why are they talking to this person? Why are they talking to that person? Right? It's going to get you to ask the right questions. And if you do those two things, it can lead you finding out who was the real murderer. The Bible is the exact same way when you're approaching it and understanding what genre it is in. And, and so, especially in a narrative form, you're asking yourself those same questions. You're paying careful attention to the text and you're asking the right questions. Why was this character put in the beginning of the chapter? Why was this character's race mentioned? I should pay attention to that. Why was the locations of all of the different characters mentioned? I should pay attention to that. Why does this character all of a sudden pops in partly way through the chapter? I should pay attention to that. 
the author is doing something much like any other author uh, that's writing a story is getting you to see the point that they want you to see. Now, you may say, well, what are you saying, Richard? Are you saying like the Bible's a novel? The Bible's fiction? No, that's not what I'm saying. The Bible's the truth. It's from the Word of God, but it's written by people, right? And, and not to say that, that that's fault. God used them, carried along. Uh, uh, 2 Peter uh, 2.20 talks about that, that people are carried along by the Holy Spirit, as it, you know, and, 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 and Corinthians talks about that we are God's ambassadors, that he's making his appeal to the world through us. So he's, he works through people. But people wrote it in a way, again, authored by God, to get a point, to get us to see something. And we get the most out of our Bibles if we see it, if we pay attention to it, the same way you would, hence, uh, a movie like A Knives Out. So let's talk about some of those tools. Let's talk about some of those ways for you to get the most out of your Bible when you see it as biblical narrative. And here's some of the, the key points. Uh, first is symbolism. Second is repetition. And third is double meeting. And so we're going to talk about all of these and get right into it. So when, when again, when you're approaching the Bible, here are your detective tools. So we'll start with symbolism. So in uh, symbolism, um, we are going to uh, talk about, um, you know, uh, symbolism occurs when a word has its own meaning, but is used to represent something entirely different due to the cultural context. So so you have one word that means one thing, but because of symbolism and the cultural context that it's in, it's really alluding to something else. And an example of this in, in kind of American culture, and apologize if you're not in America, but but you can take my examples and kind of use it for your own uh, culture. But you, you think of American culture, when you see the eagle, what does that symbolize? Right. Immediately when you see the eagle, what does it symbolize? It doesn't mean just an eagle if it's written in a novel. Again, if we're talking narrative form. If it's written in a novel or, or, or mentioned or, or, you know, uh, depicted in a movie or film or documentary, it, it conveys freedom, right? Especially in American culture, if a director or writer are going to use the symbolism of an eagle, it's usually going to convey freedom or America or in some way. Why? Because the bald eagle is the national bird. You know, when you see chains, again, in American culture, it symbolizes oppression. And, and, and in many, many cultures, it symbolizes oppression. But, you know, when, when, when talking about slavery in America, man, it is it, you cannot escape it. If, if you uh, grew up here in America or, or been in America for any length of time, race relations and, and all that stuff, it, it's a big deal. For you to not pay attention to the cultural context of that, you will get yourself in trouble. <laughs> you may say something that will be offensive if you're not aware of that. So chains can symbolize oppression. You know, the rainbow. Right. Uh, in our cultural context. And here's an example of how uh, these things could change over time when, when talking about the, the cultural context. And so in biblical times, the rainbow represented God's promise that he'd never flood the earth again. In our cultural context now, the rainbow symbolizes uh, the, the symbol for the LGBTQ community. And so, again, it, t- that you that's alluded. You see it in a film, see it in a novel. That's where your mind's going to go. And the author or director or writer knows it. They know exactly what they're doing and exactly where they are taking you. Some examples of symbolism in the Bible, you uh, will hear certain words like firstborn. That means something. Not just that they were the first that was born. It means so much more deeper than that in terms of heir and blessing, male, birthright. The author uses that term. It's weighted in, in its symbolism. Numbers. All kinds of numbers uh, have symbolism in the scriptures. Here. One, three, six, seven, ten, twelve. All of them do. Uh, those are some of the, the, the ones that really do. Again, I'll refer to uh, some materials in the notes about um, some uh, podcasts or lectures on on numbers. Animals. Animals ho- hold a lot of symbolism in the Bible. Snakes, you know, serpents, you know, deceptive, you know, dove uh, being purity or Holy Spirit or, or newness, right? Um, the sea has its own symbolism. And this is kind of cool for me learning um, over the past year. In reading a lot of of, of culture context for uh, the the the, the uh, Old Testament or Tanakh, man, it's so cool to see that. And in in the Mesopotamian culture, uh, um, 
way back or, or Canaanite culture way back, you had these um, stories of, of their gods like Marduk uh, defeating Tiamat or, 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 or Baal uh, defeating Yom. Like, they, they, again, the, these gods defeating the gods of the sea. The sea stood for chaos and, and something to be feared and, and, and to be tamed only by the gods. And so I'll put some references down. There's a great article uh, in, in a Bible dictionary that I came across that, that can explain uh, all, all of that. Really awesome stuff. So next, we'll look at repetition. So repetition, you know, looking at words or phrases that jump out uh, that, uh, that, that jump out as you as important as because they're, they're being repeated throughout the text. Um, and, and, and that, that don't need much explanation, but, you know, in any story, if, if, if uh, a certain word is continually used, um, we'll, we'll convey something. There's something that the author is trying or the director or writer is trying to get you to pay attention to. Some examples biblically is in the book of Judges, you know, ch- uh, chapter two, three, four, six, ten, thirteen all have some form of the phrase, Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. What does the author want you to get? That Israelites were cray cray. Like they were doing things that were just off kilter, that was just bugging God. And and they were not living right by uh, by the Lord. And so again, that is an, an example of what we see when it comes to repetition and and looking at repetition, um, there's another uh, way uh, as well of looking in repetition is in Genesis three. The the word naked. Um, it, there's a great podcast on that. I'll put in the, in the the notes for you to um, to look at and listen to, uh, and, and really a great book as well uh, for you to read. It, it just it covers that whole section. But the word naked was important. You know, it was strange that. That all the, the the things that you know Adam and Eve eat from the tree totally disobey God. God comes in, and, and what He's concerned with is who told you you were naked. Um, you know, you, you read that, you like, you know, in our culture, like, well, it's kind of weird to walk around naked. You know, while we're clothes now, but but when you go back and look at that, it's like, well, that's that's a weird thing to focus on. Like, why would you ask that question? You should be asking that question. Why did you disobey me? Like, or, or like, or, now I'm going to punish you. Like, like. Who told you to disobey me? Not who who told you you were naked, right? And so th- there's some great stuff there because that word is repeated. A- and when you dive into the actual language of the Hebrew, it pops up even there as well. And and language is very limiting as well in terms of the Bible, both written in Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek. We do lose some of what the author is trying to do because of language. But but that's where the cool tools and commentaries can really help you uh, fill in the, the gap. You know, lastly, double meaning. These are words or phrases that can be interpreted more than one way, either in terms of deliberate uh, or ambiguity or an irony. Look at the use of of figurative language for, for great examples. You know, the way we use metaphor in a statement, you know, um, don't, um, at times don't really make sense or, or, or certain words that we'll combine to make something or something that means, uh, it, it, you know, something different, like some examples kind of in our own culture, couch potato, right? Or a heart of stone or black sheep. Um, those words in of themselves don't really make sense unless you understand the cultural context and un- unless you understand how those words are used. Uh, you're like, okay, uh, they are, I, I kind of get that. Almost like um, uh, idioms. Now, again, not, not apples to apples, but you kind of get the same, the same flavor of it. Uh, some examples in the scriptures, uh, the term son of man, you know, there's a lot of double meaning to it. Uh, the term generally means humanity, but obviously means deeper the way Jesus was using it. Again, the gospel is a narrative form and in, in how it's written and in, in what was recorded, Jesus saying son of man meant something. And I don't think it's coincidence that son of man pops up in Matthew because the audience of Matthew was, was primarily Jews. Who would understand that reference? Again, generally determined humanity, but because of Daniel 7, it meant so much more. It meant this divine figure writing on the clouds of heaven, alluding to who Jesus himself alluding to something greater than just a mere human. So we understand uh, uh, these things. These are great tools for us to to get in the right mindset of, again, asking uh, the right questions and paying attention to the text because we can look for symbolism, repetition, and double meaning, and it helps us understand these things right away. 
And again, hopefully that, that, that makes sense. And again, if you have any questions, you have my email in the front of the, um, the, the PowerPoint or the lesson and email me and then we can talk and have some conversation about those things. So let's start to put these things to the test. Let's dive in and actually see, okay, um, how does this work? out in, in kind of a, a real world scenario of the scriptures. Turn over this to 2 Samuel 13, um, and we're going to look at just two verses. And in those two verses, a chalk filled of some great, great stuff. Uh, again, in light of the storytelling narrative form, so much we can gleam out if we understand that that's the genre that we are in. So if you're, if you're not familiar with 2 Samuel 13, this gets into the story, very sad and gruesome story of um, David's kids. And, uh, and you have some main characters we'll read in a little bit of uh, David's son, Absalom. You have uh, uh, David's daughter, Tamar, and David's son, Amnon. And we're going to talk about how those characters play, but using symbolism, using double meaning, uh, and our techniques for that in repetition, we'll find out some clues. So let's hop in. Okay, so uh, I have the words on the screen. If you're watching, you can follow uh, in your Bible, reading NLT uh, as well. Again, just two short verses. You'll quickly see how chock full of great stuff uh, it has. So verse one says, Now David's son Absalom had a beautiful sister named Tamar, and Amnon, her half-brother, fell desperately in love with her. Amnon became so obsessed with Tamar that he became ill. She was a virgin, and Amnon thought he could never have her. And so we're going to stop, stop there. Now I'll put in the uh, notes um, that you'll, you'll be able to get. There's a great book on this that a lot of this materials come from as well as a podcast I'll put in there as well that I got out of this, but it's called Narrative Art in the Bible. And I'm going through that currently right now. And this is great. It just spells out exactly how you dissect um, these stories, uh, these accounts uh, in the Tanakh and the Old Testament and break them down. And there's some great explanations uh, of how to see it. Now, for, for purposes uh, uh, to, in your study, you know, uh, the, the way we're going to break down the scripture um, really relies on the version of, of, of Bible that you're reading. Um, now, again, and you'll say, well, well, any version is all God's word. And it is. But uh, translators, again, like us talking about the narrative form, they have an agenda of how, I don't say agenda is very strong, um, but they do lean on how they translate the Bible. And again, not, nothing to take away, nothing to um, mislead, but but you, when you come to a word, which can mean a, a lot of things, you're going to have certain schools of thought hang on one way of of translating that word. And, and again, and so you'll have um, certain, when you do that, you break up the structure, you break up of, of, of how the flow of the text should, should be, again, of the ancient author's intentions. Now, to, for our purposes of breaking this down, the, the, better, the, the, the good versions to use, just for this reason, not, not to say you, you can't read them, but for the purposes of the study, you want to read the NRSV, the ESV, uh, the LEB, the uh, HCSB, the NLT, the NASB, and the NKJV kind of lays out the structure we're going to break down in this narrative form that makes a lot of sense into the story. Now, other versions will kind of rearrange rearrange it, but for the purposes, you can stick to those versions. Don't worry about that. They'll be in the notes. So let's begin. Okay, so we're told four things about the uh, protagonists. You know, we're talking about their names, Absalom, Tamar, Amnon, their family relations, David's son, sister, again, David's son, and the order of the characters. Third, we're told about uh, Tamar's external appearance. She's beautiful, right? We're given that. And lastly, we're told about Amnon's feelings about Tamar, that, that he, he loved her. You know, all of these features are crucial to the story and just the first two verses for us to understand. You know, the names are needed, of course, so that it's possible for us to identify the characters in the narrative. The family ties uh, between individuals is important for us to constitute the basis uh, of, of their relationships in uh, of this narrative. You know, Tamar's beauty undoubtedly is a reason for Amnon's love for her, right? We, we can get that by, by reading that and thus follows uh, of how things played out. But, but the way the verse is structured is, is, is really incredible. And so we're going to break 
break that uh, down right now. So we first start off with David's son, Absalom, had a beautiful sister. Now, this is crazy to think like, you know, you read that like, okay, but when you break it down, you see what the author is doing. Again, in terms of a narrative form, we see what the author is doing. It says David's son, Absalom, had a beautiful sister. It doesn't say David had a beautiful daughter. Okay, so the author's already trying to get us to see something. That Absalom and his sister have more of a connection than David does. Or, or at least in, in this, given the story. Because David is, is really pushed to the side and Absalom and his sister are more tightly close together. Right? It, author easily could have said, David's son Absalom and David's daughter Tamar. But that's not what the author did. Uh, did you catch that? Next, we get again. We get the the outward appearance, beautiful sister. That that not only just beautiful sister uh, because Amnon felt that way, but beautiful sister in general. Like her beauty was something that was known. Her beauty was something that that um, had been uh, you know it, it's not um, hidden. You know, it's not something you're like I don't know. Kind of no. I mean, it, it, it's. We get that right from the jump. Even before Amnon comes into the picture, we get that she is beautiful. We get that illusion, man, that she is beautiful. Okay, next, uh, we get that uh, Amnon, her half-brother. This is important. Amnon, her half-brother. Well, why is that important? Well, if it starts off with David's son, Absalom, and his beautiful sister, connecting Absalom and Tamar together, uh, as being close, and then following Amnon or half brother, the author's laying out. We can assume that Absalom and Tamar are blood, right? Same mother, same father. Amnon isn't. Amnon's on the outside. Amnon, same father, different mother, right? And and it's already building this intrigue here. You have Absalom who seemingly has a relationship. Uh, a close relationship with Tamar, and then in comes Amnon, who's not even same parents, um, but but only connection through David, uh, and David's already kind of out of the picture just in that first verse. Um, that that he's he's not he's a he's a character, but off to the side of the stage, and and, and you can already see the the build uh, of this of this um, opposition, and even the way the words are laid. You have Absalom, Tamar and Amnon, right? Tamar is in between both these these polar opposites of Absalom and Amnon, right? Absalom, her beloved brother, and Amnon, who who will, again, if you read the, the story, Amnon ends up, because of his obsession, ends up raping Tamar um, and disgracing her and, and, and causing shame to not only her, but, 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 just the rest of her life. Like no one's going to remarry her because she's been defiled, right? Uh, in that way. And, and Absalom ends up out of, out of anger and rage because of his relationship, ends up killing Amnon in the process. And David sits, King David sits and watches it all, right? And so, so again, but, but if you did not read the story, there's so much chalk full in these two verses that can lead you to say, wow, this is not good. This is not good, and I don't know where this is going, right? That's what we can see. And that's the power of understanding the text. That's the power of understanding the narrative that the text and the lens that we see the text, that we see what the author is doing. The author is setting us up. The author is really laying the groundwork, making it very easy for us to see where this story is going. And if we pay attention to it, we'll get the clues. We pay attention to the text and ask the right questions. Again, some of the questions that come out for me is, okay, well, who is Absalom? Uh, okay, I can ask the question that he seemingly must have a, a, this relationship with this with this woman, uh, uh, this this woman Tamar. Um, and, and and why isn't David named? Why isn't David said that that's David's son and daughter? Right? Like those are questions you can ask yourself. And when you're reading text, you should be asking yourself, okay. Why is Amnon uh, being labeled um, the half-brother? Like, why is that right there for everyone to see? There's a reason for it, right? And then, and then we, we go on to the, to the next verses as, as we read 
you know, Amnon becoming um, obsessed with Tamar, uh, that he became ill. Uh, we, we get a sense of 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 what this, this is not just obsession, how she looks great. This is like, um, I mean, it is obsession, but but this is like creepy, you know, I'm standing outside your window when it's raining, you know, relationship here. I mean, this guy has 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 gone overboard in, in his infatuation with his half-sister, right? But then we're also given the clue into that she was a virgin, which really sets up why uh, the disgrace is so uh, um, um, just hard and, 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 and um, difficult for Tamar and unbearable for her. It's a death sentence for a woman in that time. It's a death sentence for you to be defiled. Who will marry you, right? I mean, the only option you have is to marry your half brother. And in, and in the story, he didn't want to have anything to do with her. And she's like, well, you, you might as well have killed me because now I will just live the rest of my days um, just as a widow, right? Uh, or, you know, kids, but but just unmarried. And, 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 and that's, you know, sadly, I mean, in our day and age, things are much different or, or are getting to be more and more different and, and better uh, for women. But in this time, it wasn't. And, and that, that's the only thing you can hang on is, is to be married and have kids and to carry on the family lineage. But to be, for that to be taken away from you prematurely is just such a death sentence for you. You know, and so again, short and sweet of looking at these verses, short and sweet, but there's so much in there. And uh, again, I'll put some in the notes for you to read some more. Please, uh, again, for those in that kind of uh, top tier of, of Bible knowledge, pick up that book um, of, uh, of, uh, that I mentioned earlier, uh, Narrative Art in the Bible. Uh, it's a fantastic read for you to, to dive deeper. Um, actually, the author really picks apart um, multiple uh, uh, books uh, in the Bible and does this exact same thing as we break down uh, the scripture. Okay, so this is kind of ending our class as, as, as we, we've gone on here. And so I'm going to have some homework for you. Uh, as, as you um, start to prepare for the next class. And so here's the homework. I want for you to read the book of Ruth, because when we come back, we are going to break that down. Um, I'll probably break down the first chapter, maybe a little bit of the second chapter, but we'll break that book uh, down to, to use the same tools that we talked about, looking at the symbolism, looking at repetition, and looking at double meaning. And so read the book of Ruth, and then um, before you, you listen to our, uh, the next class or watch the next class, um, go watch a whodunit film uh, genre, right? Or murder mystery. Um, to, to, and again, if you're sensitive to it, don't worry about it. You know, maybe read a book, you know, some, some other substitute. But if you can, uh, watch, watch a, a, a whodunit film or, 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 you know, a film that, that, that's, that, that um, you're, you're given a scenario, you don't have all the answers, and, and throughout the film, you've got to look for the clues. I want to just for you to train your mind and looking for these things and knowing what to look for and knowing what to go through. It's very, very uh, important. And again, there's some great films out there. Uh, Clue, 1985, great. The Prestige, 2006, great. Um, Sherlock Holmes, of 2009, and Knives Out, of 2019. All, all kind of whodunit type uh, films where you have to um, figure out uh, uh, you know, who's the, the culprit or who, who's behind this. And, and again, it's great because all those movies go back and show you the clues were there hiding in plain sight. And in so doing, um, hopefully we can decipher the Bible in the same way. We can see those clues like second Samuel 13, uh, one and two, that the clues are right there in plain sight to help us better get uh, the story of what God's conveying, leading to us getting the most out of our Bible. Thank you so much again. My name is Richard Buckner, and I'm with the GPCC um, uh, Church here, Greater Philadelphia Church of Christ. And um, I'm just grateful for you listening to this class, and I hope you are you stick around with us and can listen to the next class that we do. Thank you. <music>